Good afternoon, Mr. Hausman. How may I help you? Hi. I'm supposed to receive a very important package that was overnighted to me. I just checked the tracking, and it looks like it was delivered to the hotel more than five hours ago. Just one moment while I check on that for you. Great. Thanks. I've located your package, sir, and I can assure you it'll be delivered on Tuesday. Um, I check out Monday? Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the No Vacancy Podcast. This is your fearless leader, Glenn Hausman, here to bring you through the wonderful world of travel. I want to thank each and every one of you guys for listening. Be sure to check out all my good stuff over at hotelmanagement.net and my appearances during their Hotel ROI series throughout the year. Don't forget to follow me at Traveling Glenn on Instagram, on Twitter, and I'm going to send you all sorts of great information. And I also uh, want to thank all the good folks at Bridge Street Global Hospitality for having me host Here to Stay TV. You can find Here to Stay TV on the Bridge Street channel right now on YouTube, and I get a great chance to do a lot of video interviews with amazing industry professionals from around the globe. It's why I've been in Germany. It's why I've been in London. It's why I'm going to be doing some more great trips coming up soon. Don't forget to like us on uh, iTunes. But today, because I had such a good time and we got such amazing feedback, I brought back uh, the one and only Rebecca Alicia, travel consultant with Smart Flyer. Rebecca, welcome back. Glenn, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. It's always fun hanging out and talking about travel with you. Uh, it sure, it sure is. Except traveling with me, not fun at all. Talking about travel, maybe so much. I'm really a pain in the butt, Rebecca, when it comes to traveling. I've got all of my systems in place, and I'm not really good at uh, adapting to things at the last minute. It's really, it's really quite sp- sad to experience. Oh no, that's why you should use a travel planner. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly right. And. You know, uh, and I think I'm going to have to uh, speak to you and utilize you. And I'm thinking we could even do a show on this because uh, we have pulled the trigger on a big trip to go to uh, Israel this summer. We're going July 30th to uh, August 10th. And I'm saying those dates specifically, everybody out there, because I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, broadcasting from there and we're going to do a lot of fun stuff. And uh, we'll see if I could uh, videotape my kids being uh, bar mitzvahed at the, the wall over there, which is a pretty big trend these days, isn't it? Oh my gosh, you have no idea. So many people are really opting to take the time to make memories and a family vacation rather than kind of blowing that whole budget on an individual party. Right, I know. I mean, I did that party. Um, you know, my parents threw me the bar mitzvah party. And while I have a couple of memories of it, it's it could have been any kid's bar mitzvah, really. You know, we all we all danced the horror. People lit some candles. We ate some food. We all went home. And that was really about it. Not very memorable in the long run. Uh, I definitely um, can contrast because I had a party probably similar to yours, whereas my brother, uh, for his bar mitzvah, we took the trip to Israel. And I have a lot more memories of uh, that experience than I do of my own party. So I'm I'm with you on that one. Yeah. So, you know, I'm hoping to get in touch with uh, such history. I'm a huge history buff. When I was in London um, last month, I had the opportunity to go see the British Museum and saw some really, really old stuff, which is uh, fascinating. So I cannot Cannot wait to see all of that summer. And for all of you, dear listeners, I will be bringing back lots of uh, visual souvenirs, lots of audio souvenirs, great videos, great, um, great interviews that you guys can hear and experience it along with me. And speaking about broadcasting live, as you know, um, for all the folks that listen to this show regularly, the No Vacancy podcast, the one you're listening to right now, is the official podcast of the AHOA convention, annual convention coming up April 12th and 13th, and they are pretty much sold out. If you want to go, you can go, but it's going to be difficult. They've got over 6,000 people there. And those good folks, I'm going to have a, uh, they, they're helping me build a studio out front of the trade show. And uh, I want you to come by. I want you to share your stories with me from 1 to 3 p.m. every day. Plus, I've got great CEO interviews. I've got the uh, CEOs of La Quinta lined up with uh, Red Roof Inn. I've got the head of the CVB from San Antonio scheduled to uh, speak to me because we are going to be in San Antonio. And we're going to be doing all of this live. On the Ahoa page, Facebook feed. I'm really excited. And then you can get audio versions of it here on the podcast. But uh, Rebecca, I got summer travel on my mind because uh, I keep fantasizing about going away. I know I'm going to Israel this summer, but it doesn't mean everybody else is. What's your uh, what's your overall vibe on the uh, the energy behind people wanting to get away this summer? 
Oh, my goodness. We are seeing a real explosion in the last couple of weeks over people getting ready for those last weeks of August before the kids go back to school. Everybody wants to go away. And um, I'm seeing an uptick in some different destinations this year. Things are things are changing a little away from the uh, traditional Caribbean getaway. Well, that's nice to see. I find that people are uh, are getting a lot more um, sophisticated and they want to try a lot of different places to uh, to go to go visit and in- enjoy themselves. Right. Absolutely. Uh, awesome. Okay, so um, I want to I want to get into all of these things, but I do want to put out there, everybody, if you haven't had a chance to listen to our uh, evaluation on Disney and all of the great things that are happening down there, you should check out that show. I'm actually uh, looking right now to see what day I released uh, released that show, but I have no recollection of which day that was. Do you have an idea of which uh, which day that that was? Oh, not off the top of my head. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, that serves uh, that serves my fault. But make sure you check the catalog. Check that out. It was a uh, it was a fun show. We had a great time doing it, and we learned all about the secrets that you need to know in order to maximize your Disney vacation. Now, I want you to take me through some of the hot destinations in 2017. But before we bring that up, Rebecca, I want to talk about some of the uh, the big trends that we're seeing here. Now, Choice Hotels did a major survey that they released at the end of last year, and they're saying that this year's summer travel season is going to be absolutely uh, spectacular. Did you know that leisure and personal travel budgets this year are expected to be up 42% from 2016 from $3,572 to $5,063? Uh, Rebecca, as a travel agent, uh, here in such a big jump um, must be uh, exciting for you. It means people are taking more serious trips or they're staying longer in places. I think that's true. And I think what I'm seeing, and I think we referred to this before, it's a little bit more about immersion travel now. People aren't looking for the cookie cutter experience of going to an all-inclusive, although that's great. But what's nice to see is that people really want to take their families, take their spouses and experience something different and learn from culture in a different place, whether that's domestic or international. And they're willing to commit to it, which is such a gratifying thing to be part of the industry and see that happening. Yeah, it's pretty darn cool because, uh, you know, as I referenced, I went to the British Museum in London and had a great time, but I was an observer of history. I wasn't participating in culture. I wasn't immersing myself in that type of experience. And that's the type of way that people want to travel right now. So uh, my Road Warrior fans out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you hotel your guys out there. If you're not catering towards setting the stage for experiences for people to immerse themselves in your communities, you are missing out big time. So Rebecca, what are some of the things that people are doing to immerse themselves in that overall experience uh, when they're traveling? Well, so what I'm seeing at the moment uh, is a lot of um, empty nesters going out to California and doing Napa and Sonoma, which is absolutely dreamy and gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And you can really live like a local when you're out there. So many wonderful farm to table restaurants, so much nature to be experienced, hikes and coastal views. Absolutely amazing. Um, We're having such a good time planning those trips for them. What are some of the things that you could do when you're in, um, in those areas that really immerse yourself in it? Well, you first of all, going out and seeing the vineyards and seeing how the wine is made is something that everybody does when they're there. Of course, if you're there, (laughs) you're going to have to go tasting. Um, Oh, yeah. We're seeing uh, more and more the foodie scene, which was always big there. Of course, you have French Laundry and um, mm-hmm. uh, other other major, major restaurants. But you're seeing an increase in farm to table uh, at an accessibility point for everyone who visits. And then, of course, there's all of the adventure activities, hiking and biking um, and just chilling out at the hotel, the spa. Uh, so many things to do. Hot air balloons, horseback riding. It's just I could probably go on for the entire podcast just talking about that. I think you could because that would be great because then I don't have to do so much talking and I'm very, very lazy. So, uh, you know, I love that idea. I'd like to see – I'd like to do a horseback ride while taking a hot air balloon trip. That would be something interesting. Well, I don't know about doing that while drinking. I think it's kind of a walking and chewing bubblegum scenario. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely for, for sure. Man, I love that part of the world. And I think um, the way that people love wine, or at least um, the way that moms like wine, from what I read on Facebook all the time, um, it's got to be a, a, a great kind of experience to go. Now, we both happen to coincidentally be here on Long Island, and I love the North Fork for all of the wine tours that they have out there. I haven't really been able to uh, immerse myself properly in a wine tour because I got to drive home at night, but um, I would love to connect, you know, in Napa and on the West Coast with some of those tours that take you from place to place to place so you don't have to worry about anything. Um, You're probably seeing an uptick in those kind of trips. Well, it's absolutely true. I've actually done a girls uh, group where we put together, because you brought up the moms, we put together moms that don't even know each other Mm -hmm. from different areas of Long Island, and we all go out to the uh, vineyards uh, out on Eastern Long Island, of course, using a party bus to stay safe. Nobody should be drinking and driving. And um, there are really nice boutique hotels out there. And it's a great experience and a great way to get to know other people. Well, if you uh, expand that trip to, um, you know, dads or wannabe moms, just let me know. And I'll (laughs) I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely jump on that that tour with you guys, because that to me is a really great way to um, have some fun. And I think one of the big trends that we're seeing now is people more than willing to take these kind of group trips and be thrown in with lots of folks that they don't know to experience a different culture or different experience with. Am I just making that up or is there some truth to that? Oh, no, definitely. In in fact, in some of the uh, resorts that we're seeing, especially in um, Mexico, they have something called a singles table, where if you travel by yourself, or even if you're with a couple, they put you together at a table with other people so that you can have a little, you know, a little different conversation while you're there. And I I think that's something that's really nice. Um, Of course, I don't need to talk to anybody other than my husband for hours. But some people, some people I hear might like to expand. <laughs> well, yes, especially my wife, because she has to be stuck with me otherwise. So, uh, you know, this would be a great opportunity for her to uh, discuss things with people that don't aggravate her constantly in her life, which is a great thing. Absolutely. Um, so, so another trend that we're seeing that would, of course, increase the ability to have great conversation at dinner is travel to places that are a bit off the beaten path. Mm. And one of the increases I'm seeing this year is requests for a place in Italy called Puglia, as opposed to going to Amalfi. Are you familiar, Glenn? No, I'm not familiar with uh, Puglia at all. I've never, it just, uh, never, never even heard of it. So tell me, tell me more. I want to hear about it because uh, everybody loves Amalfi. Everybody talks about Amalfi, but my guess is it's going to be uh, crowded as all heck with people that are, uh, are there experiencing it. Absolutely. Well, Puglia is um, kind of on the boot of uh, of the heel of Italy's boot. Mm -hmm. Um, It is a coastal town. It is absolutely breathtaking. Um, There are two airports you can fly into to get there. And it is truly a special place. They have resorts that are family style. They have resorts that are more upscale and for adults. And it is really, like I always say, gratifying to see people traveling off the beaten path a little bit and doing something different. Yeah, and one of the things that I love, Rebecca, is that people are willing to do those different types of locations. I feel that um, travelers have become so much more sophisticated, and they've got that been there, done that kind of attitude that they're looking for those different experiences. To me, it comes down to, and this is one of the things that I say in a lot of my stump speeches on stage, uh, on stage is uh, bragging rights. They want to come home and be able to say, you're not going to believe what I did. A hundred percent. Awesome. So tell me, what are some of the other things that people want to do? Now, take this Puglia thing, for example. You've got the, uh, you've got the resorts. You've got great meals. Um, uh, what other types of places are you finding that people are getting really excited about that we're not thinking about? Well, I will tell you that Costa Rica is hot, hot, hot. I Dude. mean, everybody wants adventure travel. Everybody wants to go somewhere, somewhere and see different things, like you said, and be active. No place offers that like Costa Rica. You have hotels there. What we're doing is pairing hotels on the beach for a few nights with hotels inland in the rainforest or by the volcanoes for a few nights. We take care of the transfers and people are really immersing themselves in this amazing, amazing destination. There's zip lining, there's treetop hiking, there's scuba diving and snorkel, zip lining, every animal under the sun you can imagine, surfing. 
it is definitely a popular destination, and there is no doubt why. Yeah, I've got a I've got a buddy that goes to uh, Costa Rica often, and we've run some uh, ads for a particular resort in Costa Rica. I gotta get them to come come back and do some more of those because it is such a great place to go to. Not that I can speak from experience because um, I keep claiming I'm going to go and then wind up doing uh, nothing except sitting here in my home studio, which is very sad. But uh, after traveling like I do to conference rooms around the world that uh, I feel I need that. But I got to go to Costa Rica. Have you had the uh, the luxury of being there? Um, I haven't gone there yet. I have been to Belize, which is I think has mm-hmm. a very similar in feel and a lot of the same types of activities. It is a little bit more of an emerging destination. I don't know that it's necessarily somewhere that people with small kids want to go quite yet. They're going to get there, though. Yeah. What age do you think is appropriate for travel to Costa Rica? I'm saying that because, uh, you know, my boys are now, uh, my twins are now 13 years old, and it seems like this would be the perfect time if I wasn't scheduled to spend uh, all my money on Israel this summer. I should probably go there next winter. Absolutely. I think once kids are old enough to take part in any of these activities, the zip lining and the treetops, you know, at nine, 10 years old, I think that's a great time. It's not too long of a flight, um, especially children that age really love the animal interactions and seeing all of the, the amazing wildlife and nature. Um, that That's a perfect age for it, for yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I'm realizing is when we were kids, travel was a little bit different. It was... Um, Go see this museum, get back in the car, go see another museum, go look at some stuff. But it feels like um, these action adventure trips of today are a lot more uh, interactive and stuff that kids would be far more interested in than just going and looking at uh, old ruins and stuff. Sure. Well, I mean, now we're going a little bit far afield, but I'll share with you that some of the uh, bigger touring companies have really realized that. So like Tauk and certainly Disney with their Adventures by Disney tours um, are really catering to uh, activities for children when they're immersed in a foreign culture. So, for example, going to London and doing like a Harry Potter scavenger hunt. You know, these are things that are really, really appealing to small children, and it makes travel palatable to them, and it's such a a gift to the parents to be able to enjoy it with them and on that level. Yeah, and for me, a lot of uh, the travel experience is just in experiencing the trip, the vacation, through the eyes and um, words of my children as opposed to me being an active participant. And I just love to see how happy they are and seeing their their faces uh, light up from learning new things. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So another big place I hear is uh, Greece this summer. Yes, for sure. And um, we have honeymooners that are going. We have anniversaries going. Um, and you can do so much with Greece and with respect to different budgets, which is one of the reasons I love it. You can, you know, play it down. You can play it up. It could be over the top. Um, one of my favorite, favorite hotels, Cannabis, is just opening a brand new Sunday Suites, which are absolutely amazingly gorgeous if you look them up online Mm -hmm. you will be crying to go and um we're just seeing a real uptick in travel to that destination awesome you know what i like about um greece not that i've been to uh greece is gonna i feel like um all of these destinations that we're talking about today i have zero experience in any of them which is kind of fun exciting to me because i get to learn all about them but um, we've got friends that uh, originated from uh, Greece or their families are originated from Greece, and they try to go back there every year. And it seems to me that um, it's a pretty chill spot to hang out. You just go and you, you, you eat fresh fish and olives all day long, and you just kind of chill out. Well, again, it's another place that you can really make of it what you will. You can go and see historic sites. You can certainly make it a more historical and educational mm-hmm. trip. Or you can go and, like you're saying, really enjoy the gourmet experience, the wine, the fresh food, and, of course, the amazing scenery, the water, the architecture. I just I heart Greece. I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah, well, all right. Now, you're totally plugged into travel, and you're probably going away. Where are you taking the family this summer, Rebecca? So this summer, we are going to be doing Bermuda at the end of the summer. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, of course, going to attend Virtuoso's Travel Week in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um So that's my uh, summer plans. Coming up, we also have Puerto Rico on the horizon and Arizona as a fall destination for my family. Excellent. Um, Where in Arizona are you going to? We're going to be doing the uh, traditional Grand Canyon paired with Sedona. Beautiful. 
Sedona. That place is absolutely beautiful. And I love Bermuda, too. Um, Bermuda, I think, is one of those real hidden gems. Um, it's really close to New York. What is it, about an hour and a half flight exactly. or something like that? People don't realize how close it is. And it is uh, a world away, but a quick flight. Right. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. Now, you know, you think about going to uh, Hawaii for that, for that warm crystal blue waters, but you're going to get warmer water and just as blue waters in Bermuda, and you really are in the middle of uh, nowhere when it comes to there. Those sandy beaches are absolutely spectacular. Um, Horseshoe Bay has got that, what, pink sandish kind of beach pink to it. Pink sand beach, and you know what else, Glenn? It's Zika free. It is Zika free. That's, that's true. You don't, you know, which is always good because uh, I don't like coming home with uh, diseases. You know, that's never a fun thing. But um, uh, Bermuda, the cool thing I like about that is it's super clean. Um, it's actually, it's a pretty, uh, wealthy country, so it's just, uh, really manicured and gorgeous and very, very upscale feeling, and, uh, you don't feel silly, and it's the only place in the world I don't feel silly wearing, uh, socks with shorts, so that's always a good thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got great caves also in Bermuda, which is pretty cool. And terrific food. They, Yes. Absolutely. It all comes back to the food, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, definitely for uh, for me. Um, I've had a, a chance to go to Bermuda three or four times now, and every single time, I absolutely love it. And let me say one other thing about Bermuda. The people there are freaking fantastic and nice, and all the employees that you run into in the different hotels, they are really, truly there to serve, where sometimes I don't feel that way in other destinations in the Caribbean. That's an interesting observation. You think I'm right at all? Maybe. Uh, or you could just say I'm right for, you know, feed my ego, which is always a good thing. I always think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right on cue. Thank you very Thank you very much. So, you know, Rebecca, I got you here and we got a few minutes left. So I'm curious as to what's the craziest trip that you've ever planned for somebody? Oh, my goodness. Um, I think you might have stumped me there. I feel like there's nothing that's too crazy, nothing that's off the charts right now. Mm -hmm. uh, people are just doing all kinds of unique experiences that appeal to them that work for their families. And so I, I really couldn't point to anything as being unusual. My favorite, I will tell you, and I'm not going to tell you who it is, mm -hmm. but I did have a client that specifically asked me for a place that she could go mm -hmm. to be as naked as possible without her husband seeing anyone else. <laughs> I like that. And you know what? There are uh, there are adult only resorts in the Caribbean. I think uh, Charisma may have one of those kind of resorts where you could um, have some quiet space to do any of that kind of stuff. But uh, not necessarily saying Charisma has that. So uh, I do not know for sure. Is there a resort that you would recommend for a little well, for this client, because she wanted privacy, we recommended a resort that had individual uh, plunge pools on the roofs of their oh, villas. Yeah, yeah. So that was perfect for her because she was able to be, as she said, as naked as she wanted to be <laughs> without her husband seeing anyone else. We were clever on that. <laughs> exactly. I, I love it. And, um, you know, quite frankly, one of the hard Scrabble lessons I've learned in my life is um, the people that choose to be nudists are not the people that I necessarily want to be seeing um, nu n naked. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I remember uh, here on Long Island, um, we've got uh, some, you know, we've got some of the best beaches in the world, not to uh, not to brag about it, but it's been written up in magazines. And uh, we have uh, Robert Moses State Park. And I think it was Field 5, infamous Field 5, where they had some of the, uh, the nudie beaches in the 70s. And and 80s and you know growing up I would want to go down there and see what the deal was and then uh, inevitably I would get down there and I'd be uh, both disappointed and disgusted simultaneously it was not 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 a pretty sight for a little teenage Glenn I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> yeah not a single word you have no clue I get that you know you run a uh, family uh, consultancy over there at smart flyer so uh Rebecca Family and nostalgia trips seem to be pretty big as well, um, especially to the parks of the Southwest. You said you're going to be going to Arizona and the Grand Canyon and all of that kind of good stuff. What does that nostalgic element mean to families these days? What are they looking for? Are they looking to um, repeat the trip and that they took as a kids when they were in uh, the back of the station wagon unbuckled in that back area and, you know, with the dad and mom smoking cigarettes in the front, blowing smoke everywhere? Or how's that? How's that working these days? Well, let's let's not go back to uh, to the smoking portion of it. But other than that, I do think that there's a real desire for people to reconnect with that feeling and especially 
now all of our kids have these handheld devices. They're constantly on the computer, on their phones. And so to be able to really separate from that, go someplace as a family, enjoy the time together, it's just a it's just a really special time for families. And when you can tie that back into things you did as a kid when life was simpler, I think that's the picture that people are trying to, to tap into and, and grab. I love that notion of trying to return to a, uh, a simpler time. I feel like uh, the world has really kind of gotten out of control in terms of what our expectations are on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of uh, productivity and what we're supposed to do. And just look at how fast moving everything is. And we need to give ourselves a little bit more opportunity to uh, take a break and make it just slow down or stop for a little while. I completely agree. Right, any tips on how to uh, do that when you're away so that your kids get their faces out of the phone? Because we used to play, uh, you know, games in the car on, on the road trips that we would take over the summer, um, you know, like geography and, um, you know, 21 questions and uh, the punch buggy game. When I was with kids, we'd, uh, we'd beat each other up over that game. But what are families doing these days to try to get their kids off of the off those screens? Well, I think optimally, if you can get your kid to leave their phone in the room for the day, that's that's the biggest um, advice I would give. Uh, you know, I, I was recently, as you know, uh, in Disney World attending a showcase, and I can't tell you how sad it is to walk around a corner and see a, a kid standing with their family and looking down at their phone. So I think leave them in the room, leave them locked up, put them in the safe and walk away. Right. And that's the way to reconnect. Agreed. The only reason not to do that is if mom or dad, you take the phone, you take the extra batteries, and then you can play one of those cool games. When I was at Disney World with the family about a year and a half ago, it seemed like every fifth person, every fifth group online was um, playing this word game where the person put the phone up on their forehead and then yeah. everyone gave them <laughs> tips and they had to figure out, you know, what the what the word was. Absolutely. Absolutely. But those moments standing in line, those are opportunities. Yes. Uh, long as they may be, those are opportunities to talk to your kids about, you know, what's going on in their lives. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of what makes travel special. Yeah, exactly. Any uh any final uh, words on, on summer travel? Any tips that you might have in order to make the vacation experience uh, better for families? Well, I would definitely recommend that people start to book that stuff now because things are getting um, getting reserved quickly and booking up. Um, and of course, I would always recommend that you use your local travel agent or travel consultant. They can really guide you and play matchmaker for you with destinations to find the perfect trip for your family. I really agree, and I'm going to be using uh, I'm going to be using Rebecca's skills here to help me and my family negotiate uh, Israel this summer. But take her warnings as real. She's not making this stuff up. I just saw her. I was at the uh, Hunter Hotel Investment Conference this past week in Atlanta, and uh, all the CEOs um, were were there for the most part. And, uh, David Kong, the CEO of Best Western uh, International, said that their summer travel is already outpacing last summer by 12 percent. That means prices are going up. Availability is shrinking. And if you want to get in there, you better do it now. So plan for those summer vacations. Treat yourself right. And maybe take a few uh, a few days off with that family and get to know those kids again. You know, uh, you know, I find that I spend more time texting with my kids and actually talking with them um, face to face sometimes, and it's just a dang shame. Aww. I know. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, Glenn. I really appreciate it. Is it okay if I, uh, if I give a little shout out to my Facebook page? It, it is not just all right. It is expected. I feel like we need to have a <laughs> shameless plug theme at this point, but uh, I will spare everybody from singing one uh, extemporaneously. Um, so go for it, Rebecca. Tell us about how to find you on SmartFlyer. Thank you so much, Glenn. You can find me on Facebook uh, under Rebecca Alessia, Curator of Travel with SmartFlyer. And please check out our amazing webpage, smartflyer.com. You will love it. It is super slick and cool, newly redesigned. Um, obviously, I would love to have all of your listeners as my individual clients, but we have a slew of agents just waiting to help anyone who reaches out. I love that. Now, listen, guys, I want you all to stick around because I've got a great interview coming up with Richard Garlick. You're probably saying, hey, who is this guy? But he's got a great sounding last name. It's uh, Garlic with a K, not the garlic that I kind of love. You'll want to listen to the – he's from J.D. Power, and we go into talking about the myths and truths about social media as a method of guest feedback. Everything you held sacrosanct about how people are responding to social media and what you should do about it. Turns out you're wrong. I'm wrong. You're wrong. Everybody's wrong. And we're going to learn how to do it right. So stick around and we'll be right back after this message. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. 
Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening to the No Vacancy Podcast with me, Glenn Hausman. You know, you're listening to this right now. That's right, right now. You're listening, but you're not the only one. Many others are too. So my question is, do you want to get noticed? Guess what? I can help you with that. Every single month, my content delivers more than 100,000 impressions. I know, I thought the same thing too. Now it's your time to get you or your product, service, or brand known by leveraging my network. I'll work with you to find creative solutions that are going to get your message to the ears and eyes that you need to attract. Just send me a note at glenn at rouse.media or find me on Twitter at Traveling Glenn. That's glenn at rouse.media, R-O-U-S-E dot M-E-D-I-A. And while we're at it, Glenn has got two ends. Thanks for listening. And now back to more great content. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. So in the hotel industry, one of the things that I find fascinating every year is there's this little company out there called JD Power. And these guys are pretty cool because it's kind of like the stamp of approval in the hospitality business. They, uh, you know, all the brands love to brag if they get a good rating from the JD Power annual survey, then it is like gold. So I said to myself, hey, I got to talk to these guys. So I found a way. I don't know what they were thinking, but I got Rick Garlic, who's uh, the global practice lead travel and hospitality with J.D. Power and also a Ph.D. with me, which I think is uh, pretty fancy there, Rick. I, I hardly got past grade school, so I'm pretty impressed. How are you today? <laughs> well, I, I tell you, first of all, thank you for having me on your uh, your show. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, you know, a lot of people know us uh, from automotive because they always right. see the J.D. Power stamp of approval. And uh, you probably have been seeing the commercials where they pile the Chevys uh, oh, on top yeah, of each other. I, I have. And I like, the, I like the rough and tumble ones like, J.D. Power Associates, number one choice, 10 years in a row. You know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, we always, we always <laughs> love those. You know, as they say, any publicity is good publicity. But, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize, uh, I, I'm glad that you recognize that uh, we're prominent in the hospitality area because a lot of people just simply know us from the automotive ratings. Right. But, uh, yeah, we do uh, studies uh, in uh, not only hotel but also auto, uh, auto rental car, yep. uh, airport, airline, and, and even destination where we rate the uh, – Top fifty cities in the uh, in the country for visitor experience. So oh, cool. uh, we do a lot in the travel space. All right. So it sounds like that um, unless you uh, uh, unless you realize that I'm really a horrible interviewer, we've got to get you back on to talk about some of these other type of topics because they're absolutely fascinating. But before we get into it, I want to go back to that uh, those Chevy commercials where they stack the cars on top of each other. I love how. Uh, how smiley all those people are, but I am darn jealous of that host because I, I swear I could do what he's doing, and it really annoys me that I haven't gone Hollywood yet here, Rick. Well, you know, I always felt like I should be a talk show host as well, so I, I share your pain. Yeah. You know, I, I think we're, we both have uh, media careers that have been, up to this point, unrealized. Well, my, my ultimate dream is to be a game show host and to bring back Press Your Luck just so I could get everyone to say, no whammies, no whammies, no whammies, stop! You know, that's <laughs> what I want to do with my life. But we'll see. Maybe one day if, uh, you know, if uh, the good folks at, uh, what is it, uh, Mark Goodson, Bill Todman Productions, if that company still exists, <laughs> then, uh, you know, In call some me. Form, I, I guess Mark Burnett is the guy you need to talk to these days, uh, That's right? That is very true. And uh, now that there seems to be an opening um, for The Apprentice, maybe uh, maybe I could be the, uh, the, the host of that. Who knows? We'll see. That'll well, you know, perhaps you'll go on to the same degree of infamy as the uh, the predecessor, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because that's what I love. I love half the country hating me, which is always awesome and, uh, and a terrific thing to do. Okay, so 2016 North America Hotel Guest Satisfaction Index. You guys go ahead and you do this study, which talks to 60,000 hotel guests regarding both their recent stays and other um, pertinent areas relevant to their, their choices. And what I think is great is that you guys are going ahead and you're really out there debunking a lot of this stuff that we think about when it comes to social media. Now, I happen to be a guy that uses social media all the time and has a lot of beliefs that you're telling me I'm crazy with here. So I'm looking forward to talking about all the specifics, but I want to know what made you think about doing social media as a method of guest feedback study here? Well, well, absolutely. Great question. So what we're finding in the market research survey world is that uh, survey rates are declining uh, year by year. 
And, uh, you know, again, this could be a nice sidetrack for another topic, but that's why we see less accuracy in polling data today, because right. it's much more difficult to get qualified respondents to take polls, and therefore you're paying more money to get less accurate information. Right. So what are so, some of the, uh, what are some of the, th- the things that are happening that are making that? Now, everyone's giving up their landlines, that's one, and I think that um, younger folks probably aren't willing to pick up on phone numbers that they're not recognizing. Is that, that's probably part of it. Is there more that I'm missing? All sorts of things. So mm-hmm. for, for one thing, like you mentioned, people are getting rid of landlines. So you have uh, fewer listed numbers. Second, there's all sorts of things like caller ID and uh, call blocks and, and all those sorts of things. And also people think that market researchers and pollsters who call you uh, are actually should be on the do not call list. Well, that's not true, but people don't realize that. Right. And then also just simply the fact that people are being over-surveyed. Um, you know, it's like I tell the story that years ago, I got my start. I began off life as a college professor, but then I moved on and, as I like to say, got a real job (laughs) and uh, went to work for the Gallup organization, Uh the Gallup Poll. And uh, when I first joined the company, the CEO at the time made all of us, no matter who you were, whether you were the CEO or the the maintenance man or the receptionist, do 10 phone interviews, uh, actually survey people over the phone, uh, 10 of them. Mm-hmm. So I get on the phone, and I'm doing my, my survey, and I, I hear someone pick up the phone very excitedly and say, Honey, the Gallup organization is calling us to ask for our opinion. Cool. And uh, there was a sense of excitement that I have not heard in years. Wow. <laughs> or have, have not seen in years. I think that that's a, a bygone era where people are actually excited to pick up the phone or go online and see a survey invitation uh, requesting the, the honor of their, their feedback. So we, we see a lot of people do it because they're, they're concerned, they're engaged and with some of their favorite brands. And you know, if you've had a hotel stay, there are a lot of people who still like to uh, fill out and give their feedback. But mm-hmm. you know, at the same time that survey research is, uh, you know, surveys are, are starting to decline in response rates, you see this proliferation of more people giving feedback now than ever before through social media. Yes. So it's kind of this reverse trend, right, where you've got surveys declining, but you've still got people really wanting to have their voice heard uh, relative to their customer experiences. So uh, there's a, a movement out there of people who believe that really when it comes to the trade-off, that social media is as or potentially more effective of a tool for gaining customer feedback than the traditional survey right. method that we researchers have relied on for many years. And so... We like to, again, as researchers, objective researchers, we like to go to try to separate fact from fiction. Right. And then also we know that social media, just as a feedback tool for, uh, in this case, hoteliers, is something that uh, they're relying on more and more, that there's all these different uh, technology tools out there that allow you to aggregate and collect social feedback. And uh, there are people who strongly rely on that. And, right. again, we, we like to look at, how important is it, uh, you know, how representative of it, how important is it that you respond to it, and uh, all those sorts of things that we, we talk about that you and I will chat about right. today. Okay, so what's interesting to me is I do want to be heard, and that's kind of why I flock to social media, because I get the feeling when I get these surveys ad nauseum, like literally any time I interact with any company that has my email, they send me a survey, and they tell me how important my feedback is, and I respond to the survey, and I do the survey, but they send so many of them, and I don't get any positive feedback or any interactions mm-hmm. with them other than them telling me my feedback is important, so over time, I start to get very disgruntled about it. My airline line of choice is one that any time I fly with them, they send me a survey that I'm supposed to fill out. And whether or not I give them all ones or fives or in the uh, comment section, tell them that I don't believe they're reading this and that they're full of BS, they never, ever respond to me personally. So it's kind of turned me off. With social media, I have the perception that I'm being heard loudly and clearly. Is that the kind of thing that you're seeing amongst customers out there too? Yeah, I can tell you that there's several components of what, what customers want when they give their feedback. The first is they want to be able to speak in their own voice. In mm-hmm. other words, they want to tell you what's important to them. They don't want to answer a whole series of irrelevant uh, survey questions that you know they, they may or may not have experienced a particular part of the hotel, and yet they're being asked about it anyway. Right. The second thing is that they want something for their time. In other words, 
the day of people, you know, going in and, and doing surveys and not having any kind of compensation, and I'm not even necessarily talking about, um, you know, actual monetary or, or point incentives. I'm talking about even some sense of satisfaction that I've just spent my time well. Right. Uh, and, and the third thing is that they want transparency. In other mm-hmm. words, they want to know just what you said, that they've been heard. They also want to know how others are responding. Uh, uh, it was my experience, typical or atypical from what other people are uh, experiencing. And they want that feedback. So it's not like you can just ask people to take a survey uh, out of the goodness of their hearts right. like you used to be able to do and, and have a lot of success at that. So all those things lead to the very dynamic that you just described of why people like to give their feedback on social media. The other thing that I'll share is that mm-hmm. social media has a very public, uh, public face to it, right? Right. So if I complain about uh, a hotel experience I had on TripAdvisor, that there's all these people who see it. There's an old expression that you probably heard, that if I have a good experience, I tell one person. If I have a bad experience, I tell ten. Well, now, if you have a good or bad experience, you potentially tell hundreds, if not thousands, of people right. through these social media sites. Now, that's really had a good impact on the, the hotel industry, and, and I'll tell you what I mean by that, is that every year we've been seeing hotel satisfaction increase uh, in our J.D. Power studies, and to some extent, that's because people really are investing more in product and service. Mm-hmm. But there's also this public accountability that if I don't treat you well at my hotel, it's going to show up in a TripAdvisor review potentially. Yes. And that's going to have all sorts of negative implications on my getting future guests to come to my hotel. Mm-hmm. So that public visibility is also why social media is a, is a powerful tool for guest feedback. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay, so... I've I've held a lot of beliefs when it comes to social media, and now you guys have the nerve to tell me that I'm completely wrong about a lot of this stuff. And quite frankly, it blew me away. I thought I knew everything, but uh, apparently I know uh, nothing. So I want to go through some of these and hear what you're thinking and why um, all of our perceptions is, does not match up with reality. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. All right. All right. Here, Hit me. Here we go. All right. <laughs> so your big belief number one, people are much more inclined to write reviews of bad experiences in hotels rather than good ones. Now, this is something that I've always thought was kind of um, interesting. I feel that um, if people really hate it, they got to tell everybody. And sometimes if people really super duper love it, they got to go on social media. And a lot of the people in the middle are just kind of forget about it. What's the truth? Well, here's the, here's the truth, you know, is that there's something that I actually wrote about back in my professorial days called the negativity effect, mm-hmm. and that is that people pay disproportionate attention to negative information than positive information, Right. and there's, there's two reasons why. One is that people generally live in a world of positive expectations, so when you go to a hotel, you expect to have a hassle-free stay. You, right. you don't expect that there are going to be problems, so... You know, whenever you violate people's expectancies with a bad experience, you know, it kind of lights up the brain in a different kind of way, and people want to talk about it and write about it and, and make, make their experiences very visible. The second thing is that all of us have a bit of a defensive posture when we're making purchases or mm-hmm. when we're uh, acting as consumers. So in other words, we want the warnings that if something is not going to meet our expectations, we want to know about it. And so we feel that if we've had a bad experience... We want to tell people uh, about it so that they'll stay away and not have the bad experience themselves. Now, that, that's all valid, mm-hmm. but whenever we look at the data and we ask people, you know, did you post a review on social media? And uh, we ask, was it positive, negative, or neutral? Did you ask a question? Did you make a comment? What we found is 80% of the time when people went on uh, social media, uh, eight out of ten times, you know, people had something positive to say about their experience. Right. Now, if you think about this, is that whenever you go on your Instagram or your Facebook page, you don't necessarily go to, to gripe. You, you, grow, you, you go there to post a picture of you having a nice time somewhere or, you know, your recent vacation. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I, I, I go know, there to just really... post pictures of food. That's really my whole role. Well, well that you enjoy, hopefully, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so anyway... Uh, yeah, at 75% to 80% of the time, people are going to say something positive. Mm-hmm. So at the same time, I will say that if you look at, uh, and we, we do these a zillion, as you know, uh, 
well, not quite a zillion, 60,000 surveys annually where we ask people to rate their satisfaction. And, uh, you know, we find that, you know, less than 10% have what they would call a bad hotel experience. Right. And so when you look at the fact that, okay, 75 to 80% of comments are positive, that there's probably still disproportionately a bit more negativity than what we might see reflected in real life. But right. for the most part, when people get on online to, to share social reviews, it's about positive things that have happened. So Amazing. we think it's a great marketing tool for hotels. And, uh, you know, if you can get your best customers to leave reviews online and, and tell their stories and post their pictures on Instagram, we think it's a, a free way that hotels can market their uh, their experiences to potential customers. Awesome. Spectacular. And one myth debunked. Okay, here's another one. Uh, people are more inclined to leave social feedback than fill out a guest satisfaction survey. Now, for me, Rick, I don't know if I've seen a guest satisfaction survey in a hotel in forever. Occasionally in a restaurant, either in a hotel or not, there might be a card on there, but no pencil to fill anything out with. So I'm just assuming that social feedback is the number one way. Well, it's interesting. If you haven't gotten a, a survey from a hotel stay, I'm not quite sure what hotels you're staying at because they still all give them out. Well, but, I meant at the, that, at the hotel itself. I will get stuff via email constantly, but um, I shut it out at this point. I've just It falls into that, right. that noise that I don't pay attention to anymore. So, so let me speak to that. Mm-hmm. So you heard me talk uh, at the, the start of our conversation about how survey rates are declining and how people want to you know, speak in their own voice and, and all those points that I made earlier. At the same time, here's what's interesting, is that, you know, basically 13% of guests uh, give a uh, comment on social media about a recent hotel stay. Mm-hmm. So 13%, uh, that's the number. And we find, you know, again, depending on the design of the survey, you know, if you make it 20 minutes long, obviously response rates are lower. But typically 13% is, is about what you would see for uh, a survey response rate from a guest satisfaction survey. Right. So despite everything I said about survey rates declining, in previous eras it was, was higher than that. But at the same time, that the percentage of people that actually stay at a hotel and leave a review is pretty comparable <coughs> to what you get in a uh, guest satisfaction survey. So uh, there are some people who believe that social comments are more representative. Uh, we would say that, you know, it, it may not be the case that, People are just as likely uh, or more likely, perhaps, in some cases, to fill out a guest satisfaction survey than uh, to, to post online. So, and, and also that 13% includes a lot of, like I say, Instagram, mm-hmm. Facebook, Twitter accounts that you know, may not necessarily be accessible to the general public. So right. we still think that you probably get more representative feedback, again, depending on the quality and the design of the survey, from the survey tool than you do social media. Interesting. All right, which brings us right into belief number three. So social media feedback has got to be at least as representative as guest survey feedback. No? Yeah, and, and again, you know, we, we've actually correlated it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in terms of actual ratings, you know, the, the, the correlation between social ratings and, and guest uh, survey ratings is, is pretty similar. I mean, it's pretty high. Uh, but really, where you where you miss out on social media is you really miss out on all the operational details. So, in other words, uh, as I said, you know, you you get general comments about the quality of the stay, and you know, if there's a problem, you get to hear about the problem. But what they don't represent at all is really capturing the operational issues that allow guests, uh, you know, to provide suggestions for improvement. So, in other right. words. You know, it, it talks about the very visceral areas of guest experience. So, again, if I went in and I had a filthy room, I talk about that, or if I had a wonderful experience with a hotel concierge. But it, tell, it doesn't tell me, for example, you know, how is the laundry service or how is the, the, the shuttle or the valet parker right. or uh, even things like how, you know, how was the, the restaurant experience? Did people come and serve my food in a timely manner, you know, it's a service attentive and all those sorts of things. We, yes. get, uh, we don't get that detail. Yeah, yeah, because right? I, I don't see anybody um, publishing on social media, ooh, my food came in a timely manner. <laughs> you just don't see anything Yeah, well, like yeah, that. And, and, and again, when you're, 
hotels are very operationally focused, right? right? I mean, if they're all about, you know, having a well-oiled machine. And so you get these, you know, sentiment comments, you know, where, where people talk about whether they liked or didn't like the experience, and they'll talk about, you know, very, like I say, very visceral areas that, you know, stand out as being, uh, you know, either a really good or a really bad memory. But in terms of all the operational detail that you need to, you know, run a hotel effectively, right. uh, they don't provide that. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, <laughs> who would have thought? I mean, you're really uh, poking some holes in everything that, um, you know, a lot of us industry folks have thought sacrosanct over the years. This is pretty, in- pretty interesting stuff. Well, when you think about it, 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 it really does make sense. I mean, oh, yeah. you, you get a, a short comment, and, and again, you, you read those comments, and we, we read them all the time, right. and they just don't give you much meat. Yeah, and you know, it's just, this is funny because all of these beliefs, I think, are uh, a world of group think. And I love to pride myself on the fact that I like to do critical thinking and look at things very differently than other people are. But I'm learning from this conversation that, wow, I really have taken a lot of preconceived notions and take them to be the truth without putting in enough of actual thought behind it as to whether or not it makes sense. And now this next one is something that I am so ashamed that I I hadn't really thought more deeply on. And that belief is (laughs) that TripAdvisor is the most important review site with which to be concerned. You would think by being at all these events that I go to and talking to the people that I go to that TripAdvisor is as – is as important to the hotel industry as the Beatles was to pop music in the 1960s, right? But well, well, you're... nobody's as important as the Beatles were to pop music in the 1960s. So I just, <laughs> but... I just, the reason why I made that reference is I just saw this great uh, Ron Howard documentary on the Beatles touring years. I don't know if you guys have uh, anyone has seen that out there, or if you have seen that, Rick. But I uh, highly recommend it. It's uh, pretty cool. But you know, I, I I tried to buy it at Christmas time, mm-hmm. and uh, Target wouldn't sell it to me, telling me that uh, it had accidentally been released earlier than the actual planned release date. And so I had it in my hand trying to buy it at Target, and they wouldn't sell it to me. And I've never seen it. Oh, that's a shame. I I won't spoil you with how it ends then. So don't don't worry about it. <laughs> is it that the band is a big success? Uh, How'd you, what? How'd you know? Yes. Well, turns out, turns out they were successful and they sold out some shows and girls screamed. Okay, so TripAdvisor is not the most important review site from which to be concerned. Tell me about this and uh, blow my mind a little bit, please, Rick. Well, you know, here's what's interesting is that it's all about branding, right? The mm-hmm. TripAdvisor is uh, undoubtedly the best-known brand of all the review sites. Right. And uh, I, I recently, and, and again, I, I don't want to quote this because I don't have my number yes. uh, in my head completely, but I think that they were evaluated at well over a billion dollars as, mm-hmm. a, uh, you know, as a, a corporate entity, mm-hmm. and if, I, if I'm recalling correctly. That's okay, uh, yep. But anyway, they're, they're, they're worth a lot of money, right? They're, they're a big enterprise, and so everybody believes that they're the most influential. Mm-hmm. Well, here's what, what's interesting is that the data that we collected show that older generations are more likely to post a TripAdvisor, mm-hmm. but younger generations who are much more likely to post social comments in general – use TripAdvisor far less off, less often, and they're much more likely to use, you know, Facebook, Twitter, yep. Instagram, and some of these vehicles. So, like, just by contrast, for example, that baby boomers, you know, that uh, mm-hmm. group that was born from 46 to 64, 55% of them, when they post a uh, review, will do it on TripAdvisor. Right. By contrast, when you look at Gen Y, which is the millennials, mm-hmm. only 21% who... Uh, post reviews will post to TripAdvisors, and 76% will will post to Facebook or uh, Instagram or Snapchat or one of the other uh, social media vehicles of choice. So, you know, again, you you really see TripAdvisor as a vehicle that really skews much older and, you know, some of the more... uh, I don't know what would I say. You know, social the social media sites right. are the ones that uh, people you know of younger generations tend to post their their comments and their the critiques and the reviews. Yeah, on. and so of, it's, it's kind of interesting. And of course, what you're saying, Rick, makes complete sense. It's just that sometimes we get into this way of thinking, and it's really hard for us to uh, consider different options. So we took it to be sacrosanct, and never even 
realize, I mean, it is obvious to correlate the fact that with the rise of sites like Instagram, um, that younger people are flocking more to that. And older folks obviously stick to TripAdvisor and are not on Snapchat and are not on Instagram and those kinds of things. So again, logical, makes perfect sense. And I'm ashamed that I didn't uh, think about it on on my own. So let me just say the moral of the story is if you're a hotel... Don't just simply worry about TripAdvisor, but worry about the, these other you know, social vehicles as well. So if you're using any kind of a, a social monitoring service, you want to make sure that you include those sites as a core component of your uh, social media monitoring strategy. Any um, input or um, ideas in regards to uh, Twitter? Because they used to be the bell of the ball, and they seem to not be as relevant anymore to a lot of customers out there. Well, well, Twitter is still very good because I'll tell you, it's interesting that whenever a, a colleague of mine was telling me that, you know, he uh, is on a plane and he tweets and he, he talks about, you know, concern or a problem that he's got or an observation. Right. And he gets a very, very quick response on, on Twitter that uh, I think the one thing about Twitter is that people uh, very closely monitor it, you know, within the, the companies that you know, people are tweeting about, that right. there's uh, – you know, there, there are people there, I don't know if they've got an alarm that goes off or, or what happens, but you know, as soon as somebody tweets something, it gets picked up and, and people respond very quickly. And uh, you know, to your point, which you were saying earlier, uh, about how sometimes when you fill out a guest survey, you wonder, did this just fall into a black hole, or did anybody read it, or did my opinion get considered? Well, when you tweet something, you, you get the response you're looking for. Right. Yep. Excellent. Thank you for thank you for that. All right, the last big belief that uh, we're going to talk about today um, is it is good PR to respond to social postings, but it doesn't necessarily impact guest loyalty, as most people don't expect a response. How do you feel about that one? Well, it, it's funny uh, because I think you know most people feel like it's it's a situation just like the uh, the survey, right, mm-hmm. where you put something on social media, it's like, well, who reads this or who will come across it? Uh, the answer is a, a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, on top of that, what's interesting is that when you look at the percent who actually expect a response to social media, in other words, I put something out there and I expect that somebody is going to respond to my review, my comment, my post. Right. That, you know, again, this is really something that's very age related because uh, when you look at the baby boomers, uh, only 19% who post a comment expect anybody to respond at all compared to 54% of the millennials right. and uh, that, gen, that Gen Y, the, the young people. And, and it literally it grows with age. So you know, we, we look uh, also in terms of what's the impact when you respond. So like say that I post a comment or a concern on social media. If you don't respond, you know, basically your, your satisfaction – uh, your subsequent satisfaction scores that that guest gives you or the impression you leave is is kind of in the toilet. Mm-hmm. And then the likelihood to re- recommend you, which is uh, what a lot of people look at, the whole night idea of net promoter, you know, the percent yeah. who would definitely recommend, that it's only about a, a third. If, if I post and you don't respond, only about a third of the time am I going to be willing to recommend your hotel to someone else. Now, whenever you respond, but you don't really resolve anything, but you at least acknowledge me, my satisfaction goes up, but my likelihood to recommend my advocacy does not. Right. Uh, so in other words, <clears throat> I feel better about you, but it doesn't necessarily make me any more loyal. Mm. Now, if I get a response and you also resolve an issue through social media, then my satisfaction goes through the roof, and two-thirds of the time I say that I'm willing to definitely recommend you, 62%. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, I, I think it's a good lesson if, there are, if you have uh, hoteliers who are listening to this podcast who uh, think, okay, what do I do with this? The, the big lesson here, the big takeaway is make sure that you respond, that you've got people that uh, are positioned, that you've hired, that are whatever they call them, professional social media responders right. that uh, will take that feedback and, and really give a meaningful um, effort to uh, resolve an issue or concern that somebody's posted about because, again, there's not only the public component to it, but people are really believing now that if I leave you feedback through social media that you're going to, to do something about it. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's a tremendous uh, insight. And really, uh, I, I think for everyone listening out there, we need to really re-clarify how important social media is in terms of understanding um, our product and whether or not it, you know, we need to have certain improvements within the, the hotel atmosphere. I have one more question for you. A couple of charts sure. here that uh, you have show that Gen Y, for example, is a little bit more engaged with um, Facebook, for example, than J- Gen Z. And then another chart, it's um, the percent expecting a response to social media and Gen Z is lower than Gen Y. Is it because Gen Z is younger, it may not be on social media as much, or is there some other trend that you're sensing is afoot? Yeah, I, I think you know Gen Z is that that really young group of people from eighteen to twenty four, right? Mm-hmm. So you know these are people who are still not particularly seasoned travelers. Uh, you, you think about the millennials that they are mainstream now. We used to look at the millennials as uh, those young kids kind of coming up yeah. to the pipeline, and they are. I mean. The future is now, you know, right? So mm. they are the future of today. They're not just simply, uh, you know, we're not just we're kind of waiting around for them to come of age. They have come of age. Right. And so, you know, they're, they're very seasoned and they're mature. And, uh, you know, they're far more savvy and likely to use these social tools that are available to them to get, uh, to get what they need from a company. Yeah. And, you know, i got to be honest with you, Rick. I liked it more when uh, people cared about us Gen Xers. You know, it was, uh, it was a... Happy days. Now I just feel like we've been put up into the uh, the trash heap on the side, and we don't count. Well, anymore. you know, I, I I hear you. You know, and uh, it's one of those things that uh, <laughs> you know you, you have to kind of just uh, step aside and let the the younger generation step up, right? Uh, but, that's uh, right. After this, I'm going to go but and. Uh, we still matter. We yes, still matter. I, that's true. That's what my mom tells me, and I promise to. Uh, I'll go hang out with some of the baby boomers at the bar, and we can commiserate, commiserate about how uh, horrible the younger people are. That's going to be my. Uh, that's going to be my weekend for for me. All right. Any <laughs> final thoughts? Closing words? Anything that we need to know is on the guest side or the hotel your side in regards to uh, yeah, these yeah, social let media. Let me sort of frame it up a little bit yeah. and say that you know uh, there's a lot of hotel companies that we talk to right now that are, you know, for, for many years have done what we would call the traditional guest satisfaction survey tool to get us uh, to solicit feedback. And there are hotels out there who feel that, um, well, you know, I, I, I can get rid of that program and now I can just simply monitor social media. That's all I need to look at right. is, you know, what kind of social feedback am I getting? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we would basically say it's not one or the other. It's a combination of both. Right. that both play an important role in providing a, a feedback tool. They, they, inf- they will, however, you can describe them best as providing complementary or different perspectives on, on the customer's experience, in this case, the guest experience. So, again, we would, we would say to any hotelier who's thinking about dropping their guest satisfaction survey and just simply relying on social monitoring, uh, that you might want to think twice about that for some of the reasons that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, understanding that social feedback is a very, very valuable tool, that it does uh, give people the opportunity to speak in their own voice, as we talked uh, earlier, is important. And there's that level of transparency and accountability that uh, I believe has resulted in people having much more positive experiences, uh, particularly in hotels, because um, that seems to me, you know, I, I get on Yelp and some of these other social sites, but, you know, the hotels and the restaurants and, and the, the travel and tourism industry, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, is the area that you really, really seem to have the greatest proliferation of social feedback. And, uh, you know, I, I think that they've done a great service in elevating the quality of product and service that uh, we as consumers get. So, so good for them. Yeah, man, I'm a big fan of how terrific the hospitality industry has has come around. They've really done a great job of creating an amazing product. I always say that uh, it's um, 98%. Everyone does the same and really well. It's that 2% that makes a big difference in terms of impacting the customer experience and making those guests loyal. All right, so, Rick, this is the time for you to give a good shameless plug. Don't be, don't be shy. Well, um, you know, J.D. Power remains the, uh, the number one best well-known brand for uh, travel and hospitality uh, research, and particularly focused through a customer experience lens. But uh, a lot of people think of us uh, as, you know, the ratings and awards people, and hopefully we've been able to have a, a good discussion here about social media that we have all sorts of insights uh, into advisory services, and 
we do consulting and, and all those sorts of things on the other side of our business. Now, oh, cool. you know, there's this there's this belief that you know that the JD Power Awards are sometimes pay to play, and mm-hmm. uh, I can tell you that that's absolutely not the case. Uh, we have people who sometimes call us up and ask how they can buy a JD Power Award. Right, you can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they are they are completely objective, and, and some of the best science that that I've ever seen in terms of applying to uh, you know any sorts of ratings. They're not based on subjective criteria. They're based on uh, customer feedback. But we've got this whole other side of the business where uh, we are available to help and partner with uh, travel and tourism companies as well as companies in other sectors to uh, help them improve their business and subsequently uh, grow the, the top and bottom lines. Awesome. And thanks for debunking that other myth, because that's one of the things that I have uh, heard and been exposed to. So thank you for, well, for that. That's, that's my favorite myth to debunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it is, Rick. <laughs> awesome. Um, if, they, if people are interested in the consulting services, just go to JDPower.com, or is there someone else somewhere else that you would recommend? JDPower.com is the way to go. Awesome. And I want to thank uh, Rick Garlick for being here today. I had an absolutely fabulous time learning all about these social media myths. And, of course, I'm going to go into the weekend now feeling um, a lot a lot foolish about myself. But you've set me on the straight and narrow, and I hope to have you back soon. Well, I'd love to come back and, and never feel foolish about yourself. Uh, you know, we're all about learning. And, you know, I'm a former professor, and I always uh, love education and uh I'm glad you do as well. I so do. And thank I was, you for having me, and I look forward to our next conversation. I was even a, uh, an adjunct at NYU there for uh, about six or seven, eight years or something like that, but going back and forth yeah, to the I'd city. I'd love to talk yeah. to you about that. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> man. Let's do that. We'll, we'll, we'll set it up. We'll have, another, we'll have another chat, and we'll get you back on the show real soon so we can talk about rental cars, airlines, destinations, and uh, cruise lines as well. I want to thank all of you folks out there for listening. Without you, none of this could be possible. Follow me at Traveling Glenn, and tell your friends, tell your family, subscribe to the No Vacancy Podcast, and I'll be back next week. That is, unless I decide to go after that guy from the Chevy commercials and take his place. Thanks for listening. Be back next week. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.